The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveller, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black, Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. <laughs> Hello, assalamu alaikum, and welcome to another episode of The Classics Show. I am your host, Shabnam Riaz. As always, a pleasure to be here. So, you know, that time of the week that I really enjoy, I really look forward to when it's that time to unwind from the usual activities that we're going on uh, about in life, the rat race and everything else that keeps you consumed. And it's time to sort of do a bit of soul searching and soul food, you know, coming back to literature, the classics, all those things that mean so much to you. Okay, so for today's topic, we are going to talk about Robert Frost. Robert Frost, of course, a name that you know nearly everybody can associate with. Um, you've read his poems. If not, if, if you haven't read his poetry extensively, it's definitely something that people have come across during schools and you know studying his work and everything. And um, he was one of the greatest names of American poetry. So to talk about Robert Frost today and his poems, his style of writing and everything, we are very happy happy to have with us Mr. Rashid Saleem, who is a poet, writer, educationist, associate professor and head of department of the English H8 Postgraduate College. Uh, Mr. Rashid Saleem, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you very much for once again inviting me. It's our pleasure. As we do in the program on the Classics Show, we, you know, we love to it's sort of um, grasp a famous personality, a poet, a writer, their works, and have a, a different dimension that we can bring along to the readers uh, to get people more interested, the people who are already familiar with, with a poet or a poetry, and for those who are not, to make it a bit more appealing to them. Tell us, um, uh, Rashid Zab, that what has it been about Frost that has made him so timeless and uh, such his work is just, you know, it goes straight to the soul, it's quoted so many times, so many people can uh, relate to it. What is the story behind his success? Yeah, a uh, very important question, because in the beginning he was considered as one of the regional poets. And uh, he started writing when he was very young. Mm. I think he uh, wrote his first poem when he was just uh, 17 or 18 years mm. old. Uh, but as a mature poet, uh, his real work came after he was 40 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, and even after that, his first work was published in England, outside his own country. Exactly. Uh, so it took some time for the people to realize mm. how important and great poet he was. So and it was also a bit ironic that he had to go to England to actually be, uh, you know, sort of accepted by the British critics there and then earn the name so that when he went back to America, he mm -hmm. was already established. Yeah, in fact, uh, in fact, he was, uh, uh, his work was rejected by American magazine for once or twice and he got uh, like disheartened and mm -hmm. then his real literary genius was uh, discovered by, I won't be wrong if I say by uh, Ezra Pound. Mm. Uh, and once his books were published mm. in England, uh, he suddenly became popular after uh, after the publication of A Boy's Will, mm. and then later on, um, 
uh, north of Boston, mm. uh, suddenly people realized that he was a great poet because uh, quietly he had been practicing poetry mm. for 20 years mm. and hasn't been publishing his mm. works. Uh, uh, but even after that, most of the people took him as uh, one of the great poets, but not as the greatest, among the greatest of the world. Mm. Uh, because his poems were very uh, simple, mm. apparently. I would say that he is really very deceptive. He so, appeared simple, yeah. but there was so much more depth to what he was writing, and many people missed the darker side of him, is it not? Mm, that's right. And uh, his contemporaries uh, were doing all sorts of experimentation, which he was uh, somehow not part of. Mm. Uh, so most of the people didn't uh, really care about him. Mm. But if we look at him now, mm. I mean, uh, the, the anthologies of literature all over the world, mm. they are full of uh, Robert Frost's poems. Mm. And uh, if T.S. Eliot is celebrated poet and he is read by the intellectuals mm. or elites, uh, Robert Frost is even enjoyed by uh, uh, a young kid exactly. uh, at a different level of meaning. Uh, so I think it, it, uh, the, if, to cut it short, mm. the answer to your question is uh, simplicity uh, and universality of themes is what made him so popular, I think. Mm. Uh, as you said, you know, at that time you had the modernist style of writing that he didn't adhere to. He went to his sort of identifying with the rural uh, audience and, and, and nature. But then he also went on to say that, you know, he resented being called a nature poet mm -hmm. uh, and that many people were actually missing the bigger picture. Yeah, he said it in one of the television interviews that he is not a nature poet because uh, the complete quotation goes something like this, that uh, there's not a single poem in which, uh, there are just few poems two, in which two, uh, the, yeah. the human characters don't appear. Mm. So in this sense, he considered himself mm. as a poet of man rather than a poet of nature. Right. Uh, but of course, no one can deny, even uh, after his assertion or claim, no one can deny that he is one of the greatest nature poets. Mm. And uh, although he is not, uh, poet of nature in the sense Wordsworth or Keats or Shelley mm. or other romantics have been because he treated nature in a quite in quite a different way. Mm. Uh, but anybody who reads any one of his poems mm. uh, would immediately consider him as a nature poet. Although mm. later on you would think that it is a human character set in a natural setting mm. uh, uh, which is the real theme mm. rather than mere description of nature. Exactly. Because his poetry, um, you know, was, was, was very deep and it seemed to have many layers to it. Uh, at a first glance or a first reading, a person would sort of think that, you know, what he has to offer is simplistic. But mm -hmm. actually it was not. He was, you know, using also very complex techniques to write in as well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in those days, people were studying, uh, like they were reading uh, Eliot's poems which were very complex in structure, mm. and they, uh, because of experimentation, new forms of narratives were used. And uh, fragmentation and uh, complexity of the world, you know, the norm was that if the world is complex mm. and poetry is uh, reflecting it, then it also has to be complex. Mm. But uh, Robert Frost uh, not only denied it, but in fact he proved that uh, being simple you can still be very uh, intellectual and you can still have deep uh, themes, universal mm. themes. Mm. Uh, interestingly, his very simple poems like uh, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening is a very simple poem where a traveler stops for a while uh, to appreciate the beauty of nature, mm. but uh, he ends it with a different tone and the whole poem uh, is written in a tone which has undertones, mm. a lot of uh, psychological themes, mm. uh, and, uh, and, and huge metaphors yeah, as well. Uh, huge metaphors. Mm. Mm. Uh, so uh, I think we should really appreciate his greatness that mm. if he is able to say such dense thoughts in mm. s simple words, mm. uh, it's 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 something to be appreciated. Exactly. Uh, there is a famous saying normally attributed to T.S. Eliot that art lies in hiding art. Mm. If this is true, I think 
Robert Frost is uh, the great one of the greatest artists because uh, nowhere in his work you find any artificiality. It flows so naturally, mm. like a stream, and uh, there seems to be uh, there seems to appear no labor of the poet behind it. Right. Uh, but yet he is so powerful, mm. so sincere to his mm. themes, and he captures it so well mm. that even uh, the greatest of the world's poets. Mm. look towards him for inspiration. Mm. Uh, so he's not just the poet of the masses, he mm. is also poet of the poets. Uh, poets actually look at the kinds of techniques that he used, mm. which are apparently so simple, but mm. still so powerful and so, uh, uh, so conveying. Mm. Exactly. You mentioned Ezra Pound. Uh, Ezra Pound, you know, his, uh, um, Ezra Pound's uh, um, influence. Uh, Robert Frost was a bit, you know, he, he didn't want to be moulded mm -hmm. according to Ezra Pound's style as well, or that Ezra Pound, the style, was looking for in Robert Frost. Tell us about that. Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, Ezra Pound once invited him to see, to see him, but Robert Frost uh, kept on hesitating. He didn't see him in London. Mm. Um, some people say that he didn't see him because of the, the, the visiting card, the name card that Ezra Pound had given him, has given him. Uh, on that card, it was, uh, instead of the address, it was written home most of the times, or <laughs> mostly I'm at home. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, Robert Frost thought it a kind of rude, not very inviting, so uh -huh. uh, he didn't meet him for, for quite a long period of time. Mm -hmm. But later on, uh, he did meet him, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, so this was maybe one thing. Another thing was Ezra Pound was a very strict editor. Uh, mm -hmm. He edited uh, T.S. Eliot's long poem into just few cantos. Mm. Uh, and you know, as a creative writer yourself, mm. it's very difficult for, uh, uh, for a poet or a creative writer to hand over your work to exactly. a strict editor. Who exactly. It's like pe pieces <laughs> of your body are being chipped away. And, or, yeah, you know, yeah, that's, uh, that's absolutely true. Um, okay, now let's talk about Robert Frost, his sort of early childhood, the, 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 you know, the environment that he grew up with, the family life, also his personal relationships, uh, because we do see that, you know, while he was professionally, when he was being acknowledged and he was writing so well, he had a lot of personal grief as well. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's right. Well, he was born in 1874, if I'm not wrong, 1878 or 4, I I'm not Mm. Uh, I can't remember 1870s, it. Can't yes. yeah. Yeah. 1870s. Mm. Uh, his ancestors were from a region, uh, an area in USA, which is called New England. Mm. And all his poetry actually mm. is within the setting of that New England. So all his characters, mm. uh, all the scenery is from New England, mm. which is like uh, a northeastern tip of the United States. Uh, states like uh, Vermont, New Hampshire mm. and Maine uh, and and few more. Mm. Uh, so he actually lived there, and he had a quite tough life. Mm. When he was still very young, his father died, mm. and uh, uh, there was there were uh, a lot of sickness, family sickness. Yeah, his children. And, yeah. He, that's later on, but you're, you're talking about yeah. his childhood here. Yeah. So uh, his life was really very tough, mm. and he worked as a farmer, which yeah. later on appears. Uh, uh, he collected his observations, mm. and he knew the characters of New England so well that no other poet could, uh, mm. could have come closer to him, mm. because he himself uh, was a farmer there. Exactly. He actually went and sowed and plowed the land. Although he wasn't really very successful as a mm. farmer, uh, but uh, somehow he, he was interested in it. Mm. And maybe as a business, he wasn't successful in it, mm. but he loved the land. And uh, mm. that's what he later on reflected in his poetry. And in fact, that would have been a great inspiration for his poetry as well, to be, you know, so hands-on experience with nature, with farming, with the sort of, you know, the this, the rebirth of planting and and harvesting or you know the whole uh, cycle in general yeah it, he was excited by the fertility of land mm. and uh, and the people who 
actually involved in this profession. So mm. you have his vocation and avocation, mm. uh, and uh, these themes abound in his mm. poetry. Uh, as far as his intellectual background is concerned, uh, well, uh, in the university in Dartmouth degree, College, yeah, he, mm. he, he, he wasn't really very successful in mm. formal education, but yeah. uh, he was awarded uh, honorary. Many honorary degrees, that's degrees. absolutely true. Yeah. And also the recipient, four times recipient of the Pulitzer Prize as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, which is a rare, rare event indeed. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So then if we talk about, as you are an educationist as well, this leads me to my next question. Um, are we trying too hard to make you know, our, our, our younger generation conform to certain uh, benchmarks that we have created for them? And is that confining to them if they're looking towards creativity? Uh, well, um, I would like to link it with Robert Frost. He was a teacher also. Yes. So he taught in a local school and mm -hmm. uh, he was inspired by his profession of teaching as well. So if he was, uh, uh, and he was a real, really a good model, uh, good model for his uh, students. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as teachers, uh, we are a great role model mm -hmm. and uh, we need to introduce our kids to the great works of art mm. and uh, what uh, they need to learn how to unearth and find out the, the subtle messages in it. Mm. Uh, rather than asking them to follow one or another personality, we try mm. them to comprehend literature, mm. make sense of uh, the literary pieces themselves, mm and uh, then use their own critical thinking and poetic skills mm. to judge the creativity of the other people. Mm. So rather than becoming, uh, you can say, uh, like rather than using indoctrination, mm. uh, we want them to appreciate literature and mm. have a direct encounter with it. Exactly. Uh, so that the work of art directly mm. uh, s speaks to them, talks right. to them. And for that, I think Frost's poems are wonderful because his poems are not mere descriptions. Only one third of his work is uh, probably description. Exactly. Most of uh, his work is uh, actually talking, yeah. talking to the reader. Mm. and uh, Thought provoking. And, yeah, thought provoking and dramatic. Mm. Once I think he wrote that uh, all writing uh, is, is dramatic. If it is not dramatic, uh, it's not really worth it. Mm. So uh, he started becoming a short story writer and a playwright, which he was not very successful at. Mm. But later on, he used the skills that uh, he had, uh, the skills of a short story writer and playwright his in his poems. And that exactly. made him a unique poet. Mm. So he was unlike any other American poets of his time. Mm. Uh, and it's, in fact, for the critics, it's very difficult to... Mm. Uh, to to uh, place any label over him. Mm. So although there are people, as you mentioned earlier, who say that he was not a modernist poet, mm. but certainly he was not a traditionalist either. Mm. Uh, you can put him at the crossroads of the 19th, late 19th century poets, mm. uh, but also there are lots of modern elements in it. Mm. As far as the the conventional form is considered, he used the regular rhythm He's, uh, he of the poetry, the poetry yeah. which was unusual at that time. Mm. Uh, and he used the rhymes also. Mm. Uh, he also used the coherence of the narrative, mm. which in those days uh, was not considered uh, such, a, mm. such a big skill. Mm. Uh, but apart from these conventions, he still was innovative in a different way. A different uh, for example, he tried to use the old... Uh, meters, English meters, mm. and tried to set it along with the colloquial speech mm. of the Yankees mm. who actually lived in New England. Exactly. And that was uh, an experiment that nobody actually, uh, probably there was one other poet, Robinson, who was doing that, but mm. he couldn't master it as much as mm. uh, Robert Frost did it. Mm. So unlike the other regionalist poets, he mm. was the one who was regionalist but at the same time, he was universal because he spoke to human beings across mm. the world. Mm. Exactly. So, um, 
Okay, now, if we talk about him as a person, it was said, I mean, I don't know how, how true this is, that when it came for him to recite his poetry, he was a bit hesitant, he was a bit shy, uh, which uh, sort of brought him onto a unique sort of style when he was uh, reciting his poetry. Is that true? Uh, yeah, and uh, in fact, he became a celebrity later on, uh, and uh, he was shy, he, he had stage fright, hmm. and uh, I think at the inauguration ceremony of uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, John F. Kennedy, mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to, he actually wrote a poem and he wanted to re recite it, but uh, but because of his eyesight and because of the glare of the paper, he couldn't read it. So it, yeah. he read another poem out of his memory. Which was very uh, good. <laughs> yeah. Which was an excellent, I think it was an excellent narration. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Mm. We'll be going for a break. Stay with us. Don't change the channel. Welcome back to the program. And of course, how can we, you know, have a program on Robert Frost and not be able to read some of his most fantastic works? Uh, and we're also, you know, delighted that our, our guest who's in the studio today, Rashid Salim Saab, you have translated almost all of his popular poems, about 25 in total. Mm, that's right. So was this sort of a challenge because uh, Robert Frost is known to have said poetry is what is lost in translation? Yeah, I just uh, did it as a challenge. Uh, so maybe it's not poetry, I think, but uh, I still wanted to do something. Mm -hmm. At least I should uh, put some effort. No, I've, so I've, just I've read the first translation. That is absolutely amazing, the way you've been able to capture uh, the whole essence and the meter as well. And this is a very, very short, very, very uh, strictly structured poem. The one that we're going to read right now is um, Fire and Ice. And then we, after I've read the poem, we're going to listen to Rasha Saab's translation in Urdu of that as well. So, fire and ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction ice is also great and would suffice. Your translation, please. Yes, sure. Uh, Urdu me iska unwan hai aag aur barf. Kuch kehte hain ant jahan ka aag se hoga. Kuch kehte hain barf se hoga. Itna to maine chak rakha hai khahish ko. Unka hami hoon jo ant kahen atish ko. Lekin dunia ne ho gar do bara mitna. Main nafrat ke bare mein hoon waqif itna. कह सकता हूं बर्फ में ऐसी इतलाफी है यह भी ठीक है और काफी है वंडरफुल दैट्स एक्सीलेंट um how how long did it take you to you know capture the essence because this is basically word play and one of the hardest things is to recreate something that is already there in fact it was one way of reading his poem for me uh, i started translating his poems when i was a student of masters in english so when i Okay. Uh, my teachers actually uh, made us read his poems hmm. immediately in order to read it. I started translating it and uh, some of the poems were translated then hmm. and later on when I shared it with my friends they said why don't you go ahead and translate the, the other popular poems as well. So I, uh, I did it and hopefully these will be published soon. That's fantastic. That's great. So, how were you the first time you you sort of you know you translated his work? Which which were the most difficult ones that uh, you you had to spend a lot of time in and sort of? Uh, well, his poems can be uh, divided into different kinds of genres. Mm. Uh, the easiest ones, I think, are the ones that are like ballads, written in the forms of ballads, which are only few. Mm. Uh, descriptive poems are easy. Mm. The most difficult are the dramatic poems because they have the wordplay and the particular tone of the New England, mm. uh, which is not easy to capture in a different culture. Mm. So it's like 
uh, cultural transposition rather than translation. Mm. So let's talk about this poem in general as well. Uh, it seems it's very strictly structured, nine lines, and the message is profound. Again, mm -hmm. Frost at his best. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it was a philosophical question where, whether the world is going to end in fire or in ice. And there are religions that are divided on this question. Mm -hmm. uh, but he made it, as, uh, made it an intellectual question. Mm -hmm. And there is a ly lyrical quality in it. And uh, uh, he used it as a symbol, as a metaphor. So uh, fire, for example, is uh, obviously it is a symbol for desire. Mm. And uh, the, the ice is hatred. Uh, yeah, hatred. Mm. Uh, but so he turned it, the whole discussion into uh, a metaphor for life itself. Mm. So if it is uh, hatred and desire, mm. uh, then we don't have to wait for the next world in order to be part of heaven or hell. Mm. We can make it here. Exactly. That's uh -huh. absolutely true. Um, the next uh, poem that we're going to read uh, today is uh, The Road Not Taken. And then after that, we'll, we'll hear your translation for that as well. And we talk about the poem as well. Um, so I'll start that now. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how many leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Again, completely profound, timeless. It has sustained the ages. People quote it again and again and again. And you can uh, interestingly about this poem, Robert Frost thought that most of the people have misunderstood it, mm. so it was uh, not easy to translate it. But mm. anyway, uh, first Please. I would present its translation in Urdu, and then we would talk about it. Chhod diya jo panth, ek sunehre jungle mein do panth bicharte the. सद अफसोस के दोनों पर मैं चल नहीं सकता था एक मुसाफिर था मैं उस जा खड़ा रहा था देर जितना मुमकिन था एक रास्ता दूर तलक देखा जिसके बाद वो हो जाता था घास में जाकर ढेर फिर दूजे पर चल निकला जो उतना ही था खूब और शायद पहले से बढ़कर जी को भाता था क्योंकि सब्जा उस पर चलने को उकसाता था लेकिन सच्ची बात तो ये है चल चल उस पर चाल कर डाला था लोगों ने वो उतना ही पामाल और दोनों उस सुबह तो बिल्कुल एक ही जैसे थे गीले पात पे कदमों ने कुछ नक्श न छोड़े थे पहला मैंने और किसी दिन पर रख छोड़ा आह लेकिन इस दुनिया में जैसे राह से निकले राह डर था मैं अब कभी भी वापस आ नहीं पाऊंगा यूं बतलाऊंगा मैं एक दिन ठंडी आह के साथ मुस्तकबिल में जाने कितने माहो साल के बाद एक जंगल में बिछड़ गई थी दो राहें और मैं मैं उस राह पे चल निकला जो कम फरसूदा थी और उसी के बायस हूँ मैं आज हूँ जो कुछ भी दैट्स वंडरफुल वंडरफुल एक्सेलेंट ट्रांसलेशन सो द मैसेज रॉबर्ट फ्रॉस्ट सेड इन वन ऑफ हिज लेटर्स दैट ही एक्चुअली रोट दिस पोइंट टू for one of his friends mm. and his friend often they would go for walk and his friend was always indecisive he couldn't mm. decide which way to take and mm. if he took a wrong one uh, later on he always regretted so in uh, uh, hum humorously he thought that it was just mm. uh, a poem to please his friends but mm. 
of course it had many undertones and uh, mm -hmm. of course this is one of the dilemma that we all face in mm -hmm. our life mm -hmm. uh, we can't make decisions and mm -hmm. if we take one we always regret it afterwards mm -hmm. so it's not just uh, uh, taking one path or the other whichever mm -hmm. path we take mm -hmm. in the end we would be saying the same thing mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's really surprising how so easily mm -hmm. with such a flow uh, he says such a complex thing That's and uh, th th this I think uh, gives us the real quality of his poetry and that's why he is popular all over the world. That's true. Uh, because uh, this image is very common, all of us have experienced mm. the two ways diverging in our lives and one way leading to hundreds and thousands of ways mm. and we always regret our decisions mm. no matter which way we take. Mm. So uh, what a beautiful way of it's, expressing it's, it. It's amazing and you know the way he's also said uh, that there's no way of knowing about the future, there's mm -hmm. no way of predicting what will happen. Mm -hmm. So the lure of something and mm -hmm. the reason the reasons that amount to us making a decision. I think that's uh, you know, really beautiful the way he said. And the amount of information that we have in order to make a decision, the amount of information. Exactly. Uh, we, we always, uh, we never have enough of it. Mm. So we can never be 100% sure whether our decision was right or wrong. So basically what happens is from inside you've made a decision mm. subconsciously. Mm -hmm. And you're wanting the logic or the sort of rationale behind it to be able to say, you know, this is why I'm doing this. But inside where your heart has made that decision, you're going to end up doing that anyway. Usually that is the case. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also what he's, you know, em emphasized in this poem yeah, as well. Exactly, exactly. And, and um, also the attraction of doing something that somebody else hasn't or, or venturing out on, on a new path. As he says, you know, um, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a path where seemingly less people have wanted to go, so why? I mean, his, it's question upon question. He opens this box where he gets the reader to think and think again. And um, I think that's one of the main reasons to why this, this poem as well has been so wonderfully received. Yeah, he weighs the, uh, the two paths and mm. tries to select one. Mm. So one of them wanted wear. Mm. and no one, no feet had trodden it black. Mm. Look at the wonderful image yes, here. Yes, exactly, imagery uh, is amazing. Yeah, but, uh, but still he knows uh, that somehow both of the ways they look same, they mm. are similar. Mm. So no matter whichever he takes mm. from, uh, in future he is going to regret it because he mm. didn't take the, mm. the other one. And also the concept of time, of time never yeah. being able to be something that anybody can capture. And when he says that, you know, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. Uh, the, the, Im, you know, the impact of that decision and what it would make for him or for anybody else in their life. There's sometimes such insignificant moments in life. I mean, this is a conscious decision if you're thinking about something. Sometimes they're just turning points in life. They seem rather insignificant, but you just never know that a certain decision to do something in a different way or to, you know, go, go on another journey is actually going to shape the rest of your life. Yeah, that makes all the difference. Exactly, that's, that's, that's great. So how long did it take you to translate this one? Because this is a longer yeah, one. I, I don't uh, remember it exactly, but normally it's, it's like uh, feeling the poem. So once you are in it, I, mm. usually I read it uh, maybe a hundred times, mm -hmm. and then uh, maybe in solitary move, uh, moments, I just recollect them and mm. Uh, when I think I'm, I've started feeling the way the poet mm. might have felt, then, then it's not difficult to put it on the paper. Right, it, it and then that's long. when you're going to, you know, first you get the feel of it and yeah. then you'll be you able You start to living with it actually. So yeah. that's the moment when it's easier to compose. Right, right. Um, translations, now let's talk about translations. So what, what I feel is that we have uh, Pakistani writers of course, you know, the uh, Urdu poets, they have their own forums, many, many avenues where they can project their work. Pakistani writers writing in English, how much can they benefit from translation and should they be 
uh, presenting their work that way as well for a broader audience in Pakistan? Yeah, sure. I think there should be a separate section in Academy of Letters who should only deal with translations. Mm. And we should project our own regional local literature into English. And mm. we should also introduce the word literature mm. into Urdu. Mm. That uh, makes, uh, that would be a great favor to Urdu language and it would be a great favor to to the rest of the world to introduce them to our great works. Exactly. Uh, so, yes. Uh, yes, that's mm. an important step. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, the uh, last poem that we're going to read uh, today from Robert Frost is Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Again, one of his, uh, the end lines are quoted again and again and again, and they remain timeless as always. And that's the, the amazing thing about Robert Frost, because as you said, his simplicity is so appealing. Mm -hmm. uh, this poem has almost gone to the subliminal level. So even if you are not conscious, somehow you are repeating the, the last lines to yourself. Guess, yes. and, and they have been uh, part of popular media. You know, many movies, mm. they are actually made on the just mm. one, this stanza. Exactly. And uh, uh, even if we haven't studied psychology, but when we read this poem, mm. we somehow say how well he knew human beings, human nature. Mm. And it, it seems as if it is the tragedy of myself. So mm. everybody who reads it, can the road relate. not taken, Can stopping relate. by woods on a snowy evening. Mm. So the kind of tension that we have between duty and beauty, mm. and it's difficult to decide and strike a balance between mm. the two. And then also, you know, um, uh, the, the lure of rhythm and rhyme as well, uh, that, that was also something that, that, as we're children, when we're children, we'll remember nursery rhymes because of the rhythm and the rhyme as well. This is also something that, you know, just uh, yeah, here finds, it yeah, way he it finds it buried inside yeah. you. Here I would like to say that uh, Frost once said that uh, he wanted to capture the sound of the sense. Most of the poems uh, we think are composed uh, with words, mm. but he, he goes to a concept which is more fundamental than the words. Mm. He tries to capture the sense of the sound, mm. and that's why he, uh, he had a particular cadence mm. of the Yankee cadence and through that, because a lot of messages are conveyed subtly through verbal gestures mm. uh, and they can't be captured merely by diction. Mm. Uh, they come through meter, through rhythm mm. and through rhyme and the pauses and mm. lots of other uh, verbal clues that we are not even aware of. Mm. Uh, so the, the most impressive thing about his poems is that they don't just have the message. Mm. They also have the feelings and emotions and we start feeling it the, in the same way because of that sense of the sound. And that was the most difficult for me to capture because it's easy to translate mm. uh, the message. Mm. But the emotion which is uh, stirred with the help of a certain cadence mm. uh, or a particular uh, speech, that was not easy. So anyway, I tried my best. Mm. And uh, f the translation for this poem actually came when I was the student of masters. And uh, that was probably the first poem that I had translated. And that was his me, yeah. first. I that see. was my okay. first to translate. Okay, mm -hmm. that was your first. That, that, that you, yeah, that, and that inspired me. Right, right. And that inspired you to uh, carry on with the rest of yeah. the translations <laughs> as well. So, okay, so let's, let's listen to you. Robert Frost's Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Yeah, Fantastic. so one can keep on repeating these last exactly, lines. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so my the, translation yes, of this yes. poem 
جنگل کی برفیلی شام میں ٹھہراؤ یہ جنگل معلوم ہے مجھ کو کس کا ہے گرچے پاس ہی گاؤں میں وہ رہتا ہے دیکھ نہ پائے گا یا میرے رکنے کو برف میں ڈھکتا اس کا جنگل تکنے کو سال کی سب سے تیرا شام کے لمحوں میں ٹھٹری ندی اور اشجار کے جھرمٹ میں میرا گھوڑا بھی اس سوچ میں غلطا ہے جب کہ اپنی منزل ابھی قریب نہیں کیا ایسے میں رکنا یہاں عجیب نہیں گھوڑا اپنی باغ کی ساری گھنٹیوں کو شاید بہرے استفہام جھٹکتا ہے شامل ہے ان گھنٹیوں کی جھنکار کے ساتھ سر سر کرتی ہلکی تیز ہوا کی چاپ نرم ملائم برف کے گالوں کی برسات جنگل گہرا گھنا ہے اور سہانا ہے لیکن مجھ کو اپنا عہد نبھانا ہے اور سونے سے پہلے میلوں جانا ہے اور سونے سے پہلے میلوں جانا ہے Again, this is one of his, you know, most famous works, as we know, widely quoted as we, we were talking about this again. Yeah, what he does in this poem is uh, probably uh, something formulaic. Uh, this is very repeated theme in his poetry. Mm. Uh, so he often talks about tensions between two forces of life. Mm. So nature, man. Mm. Uh, here he has... Uh, the tension between beauty on the one hand mm. and the sense of duty on mm. the other hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's difficult to, for, for any man to make a decision. Mm. Uh, but interestingly, the whole poem goes in a way, you have uh, lots of uh, hissing sounds here. Mm. And those hissing sounds give the impression of somebody who is too tired after the whole day's work. Mm. And uh, we, we, we start feeling, uh, on the one hand, we appreciate the beauty and we want to stop here. Mm. But at the same time, we are also reminded of the promises that we have to keep. Mm. And we are also feeling so tired that at, towards the end, mm. we, st we, we start repeating it mm. to ourselves. Uh, sort of like a mantra. Yeah, mm. like a mantra. And mm. it, it is like a reminder to ourselves. Mm. We have a lot of other things to do. Mm. And, uh, but uh, you can also take it to almost to another level. For example, you can also think of it as a conflict between urban and rural life. Mm. Uh, so uh, the owner of these words, mm. he lives in a nearby village, but he is not out there to appreciate the beauty of his trees. Mm. And he won't even see the poet stopping there. Mm. Uh, he is only concerned with the monetary mm. benefits of his words. Mm. Uh, so he, he can't reap these benefits that the poet is reaping. Mm. And it is interesting when he says that uh, he would not see me stopping here mm. uh, to see his words fill up with snow. Mm. This is interesting. Mm. Uh, uh, so th th this is one thing. Another thing is that uh, living in a village mm. and going to a village mm. has altogether a different uh, kind of responsibilities. Mm. When you are part of a civilized society, you can't uh, just go out in the wild and uh, in freezing cold, you, you can't just stop there. Mm. And here you can take the horse as a symbol. Exactly. A uh, symbol of uh, civilized life because mm. horse was tamed. Originally, he was a wild animal. But later on, the horse was tamed. And when uh, the horse here is shaking its bell to mm. ask a question, why you are stopping here? The farmhouse is not here. Yeah. So this rational sense of responsibility, which we have somehow infused in the domesticated horse, yeah. is coming uh, through it. Although he is uh, a horse is a wild animal, mm. uh, or it used to be a mm. wild animal in the past. Mm. It should but love the beauty. Yeah. Yeah, but here he That's is... That's also about the domestication of the, the yeah. horse as well. So, uh, in other words, why are we asking this question of stopping in a words is mm. like we are also domesticated. But there is some, some wild animal inside us that somehow makes us appreciate the wilderness, but we have to come back to the To reality, world. to practical civilized life, world. and also... Yeah. Some people have um, sort of, you know, put his miles to go before I sleep. Uh, to be his question of death as well. That's right. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if you take it as the 
journey of life mm. you only stop for a moment mm. uh, where you have uh, something to appreciate mm. but this is only the transitory period of your life if you mm. believe in the life after death mm. then you have lots of promises to fulfill and then you have uh, then you still have to travel long miles mm. before your struggle is over mm. but it also uh, uh, one of the quotations uh, which is often quoted by Frost is I can sum up life in three words it and that is so. life goes on yeah. and uh, you find that uh, miles sure. to go before I sleep actually captures that theme of mm. life going on so mm. life won't stop for you if you want to appreciate beauty mm. uh, you will have to pay the price for it mm. uh, so that is another kind of dilemma that modern man nothing faces. Nothing yeah. comes without consequence yeah. is one of the themes as well. Um, uh, Rashid Salim Sab, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's been wonderful uh, to talk about Robert Frost and it's been wonderful listening to translations as well that have you know, further complemented his um, amazing work. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's all, I think uh, there is never enough time to talk about his poems. Uh, so true. I would uh, say that the audience, they themselves read the poems and appreciate them. Absolutely. They, they might find uh, the things that we skipped. Exactly. And then for everyone, you know, art is an interpretation of that individual. So there are many things that a, a person can take away from there yeah. that, that many people don't. So that's also very yeah. true. So um, here we are at the end of today's program. We've had a wonderful discussion on Robert Frost, on his poetry. If you're not familiar with his poems, do read them, do pick up a book and do, you know, dwell into that, that wonderful world that is waiting for you out there. So until next week, stay happy. Bye-bye.